Interestingly, when we were looking for a uh, presentation for this year's summit, uh, we knew that the provincial heritage theme was about the power of energy, or about the history or heritage of power generation. So we like to be thematic and somehow follow the theme. We don't always do that, but we do, do generally like to do that. And uh, we were fortunate this year in that uh, Christine Newsner of the Community Archives mentioned that there was this group that existed that I had no idea existed. <laughs> you weren't on our mailing list or anything. Now you're going to be on our mailing list from now on. So we'll probably see you every year here, in some form or another. Uh, but we're, uh, it was a pleasure, actually. I went and met with uh, Mike Morris and, and the others, and he basically gave me a tour of a museum that they have. This is out in the power generation station out on um, East, well, uh, Jingle Pot Road. Sorry, Jingle Pot Road. You know that big power substation that's there, not too far from Westwood Road? Did not know that there was a whole museum in there, and there's an interesting, it's a very much set up for, uh, for gatherings and meetings as well. So it was actually a beautiful facility, and I was very impressed, actually, and thankful for the tour. So um, maybe what I'll do is I'll ask Brian and Jeffrey to come up, and you're going to do the, uh, the honors on as far as the introduction of the group and of uh, the two keynote speakers or the speakers that will be presenting for us. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Chris. If I could use the lecture in here and to see my cheat sheet. But my name is Brian Jeffrey. I'm a member of the BC Hydro Power Pioneers. We were the employees of BC Hydro, BC Electric, BC Rail, BC Transit, BC Gas, all the predecessor companies of what is now today BC Hydro. Our group was formed in 1989 with a lot of support from BC Hydro. We have now got 15 groups throughout the province, various various locations, and uh, it's uh, we have a lot of fun. I, I guess probably with talking about our motto is supporting communities and each other. So we're um, into, into social activities, obviously. Uh, talking about having fun, that's our our main thing, we have luncheons, we have field trips, we have uh, potlucks, we have uh, every second year a jamboree where we all get together at some location in the province that people from all our different uh, districts and so on can get together and reminisce and have, again, have fun. We have a wonderful lifestyle program supported again by BC Hydro where we encourage both the volunteerism in the community and an active and healthy lifestyle. We have a number of community activities. Um, being the chapter for the Upper Island, we get involved in science fairs at schools. We, um, we're involved in the heritage fairs, which are a relatively new um, activity at schools. Uh, I went last year and it was great. And uh, we have a literacy program where we collect new books for school libraries and each year we pick a we pick a school district to donate those books to. Um, we do this province wide and it, we're getting up there. I, I think someone may correct me if I'm wrong from our own group, but ten thousand books over the last few years. And the schools really do appreciate them. We also we also get involved in charitable efforts. Uh, we raise funds for the, primarily for the Children's Hospital. That's been the big one. And there's a program called the Miracle Millions Campaign where we're trying to raise over the years a million dollars for the uh, Children's Hospital. We have things like Jeans Day buttons we sell. And some of our members really do, really do manage to flog a lot of those buttons. If we're involved in the big bike ride. We uh, raise money. Um, at branch functions, we sell books, um, and I'll talk later at the round table about the books we have. Um, we are involved, heritage-wise, we have produced two books, one being the um, story of BC Hydro predecessor corporations, Gas Lakes to Gigawatts, and the second one being the tale, the stories from the two rivers, the peace and the Columbia projects. So they're very interesting. We have two museums. We have, I don't get this right, State Falls? Yes. Yeah. State Falls Museum, which is a functioning old power generating station on the mainland. And our little Jingle Pot Museum here 
in Nanaimo, where we've tried to gather pictures and mementos and some of the oldest electrical equipment you've ever seen. We've even got a couple of the original incandescent light bulbs that Mike tells me still work. So they're uh, pretty rare these days. So uh, without further ado and boring you all about what we do, we'd be happy to talk about any of it in, at the round table. Um, I want to introduce Don Mason, our tech person, professional engineer, and Apple specialist. <laughs> He's the one that's making the, the pictures appear on the screen, I hope. And Mike Morris, an individual it's been a real privilege to get to know. He's an alignment. I asked him, what is it you do, Mike? He said, well, I could be. I'm a BS artist. Maybe that. I said, well, Mike, uh, let's just call you our storyteller. But he's the guy who was up the pole in the middle of that horrible storm. And her power went out, and he was up there trying to fix the, trying to fix the lines. But he knows an awful lot about the Nanaimo area, the Duncan uh, utilities, and he and, uh, and he has put together uh, just a great little presentation with some really surprising footage. So I'm going to just turn the session over to Mike and let him carry on. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Just got to go get my papers. Well, first of all, sure was a great day today. See that sunshine, and then you hear the forecast for the weekend. It's going to snow. I really don't care if it snows anymore because I don't have to go to work. <laughs> I'm not a Nanaimo son, I'm a Salt Spring Island son, but I was born in BC, and that's important. Uh, I'd like to uh, tell you that I've never spoke publicly before, so I'm going to stumble around here a little bit. And also, I'm going to talk in imperial measurement, because I don't know a thing about metric. I'm sure you people know feet and inches and miles. So that'll be a little bit of a help. Uh, sometimes I might find myself stumbling a bit because I'm here right now, but I don't know where my memory went. <laughs> I'm gonna have to start off, I guess, can you hear me at the back there? Can you hear me, Leonard? Everybody can hear me. With Nanaimo Electric Light and Power Company. And it started, uh, where am I here? In 1888. They didn't have any logo. This little piece of paper here, which is out of the local paper, we found it in one of the desk drawers and it's now up at our museum and you'll notice at the bottom it says 1924. So that was an Animal Electric Light Heat Power Company Limited. And then we moved on a little bit and uh, actually we didn't go to the BC Power Commission. We became the Nanaimo Duncan Utilities but they didn't have a logo it was just NDU, so we couldn't put it up. When I started with the BC Power Commission, this was their logo. And of course it was the, supposed to be the setting sun. But everybody <coughs> thought it was the rising sun. So, not being Japan, they got rid of that. And they went to BC Power Commission. Now, I can't tell you what that logo means. That's the one we had before it became BC Hydro. Now this is the original, as Tom says, BC Hydro logo. You think it's, oh, 
that's it, but it's not. What we have, and when the H2O was water, so it's the form of an H. And being green on the top side represented the green forests of BC, and the blue below represented the deep blue oceans of BC, and the other top of the H, of course, represented the high mountains of British Columbia. So that's what that logo was all about. Here we go. The original power plant, built in the 1880s, was at Bastion and Fraser Streets. You notice that it is all <coughs> wood. And of course, being coal-fired, it was steam-fired, this plant, that you would expect if there was ever going to be a fire, that that's where it would start. But it didn't start there. In 1888, Mr. Alexander Shaw built the first electric light plant. Get back where you were. <laughs> <laughs> the plant consisted. Plant consisted. Dad, boy. The plant consisted of two 25 kilowatt direct current dynamos at 110 volts each. There was also a machine for commercial lighting that was turned off at 12.30 a.m. Talk about power smart, even then. <laughs> the first plant was located on the east side of Fraser Street, near the west end of the Bastion Street wooden bridge. Our house, as you can see, was a wooden frame building and it was destroyed at 3 p.m. on May the 6th, 1894. Get back where you were, don't you? Are you ready for that yet? No, I'm not ready for that. Fire broke out in the furniture store of D.C. McKenzie, located on the west end of Bastion Street Bridge, on the north side. The fire brigade arrived in record time, but too late to save the building. Water was played on the bridge in the adjoining buildings. Unknown at the time, this is the bridge here, unknown at the time, the fire was creeping underneath the bridge and destroyed the following buildings. Craig's Water Wagon Works, the electric powerhouse, which was previous, it's still supposed to be there. The Chinese Laundry, the Harness Shop, Mrs. George's Fruit Store, the Laundry, and Fruit Stand were located in the Waddington Block and the residence of Marcus Wolf. And Lawrence Soda Works were saved from the fire. Change of wind direction. So we're looking at the picture, the wind, it must have been blowing the southeast, get under the bridge, and the wind changed, became a northwest, as far as I can figure out, because it says wind direction, and saved Wellborn's machine shop, which was less than six feet from the electric light building on Fraser Street. Now you say the electric light building, that electric light building is what we call the line room nowadays, so there was material there for working out in the line, etc. This is after the fire. You can see the wooden bridge, it's pretty fuzzy. See the wagon wheels from was probably from the wagon works that burnt down. And I was talking to an ex-alderman, actually, many years ago. Many years ago, he was an alderman and also an ex-BC Hydro employee. And he was a, a paper boy in the 40s, 1942. And through there, down on Fraser Street, 
And he told me, he said, there was a lot of soldiers down there and it was still a pretty hot spot. <laughs> it was the red light district. Okay, now we can change. Oh, yeah, you can see some of the charred timbers from the old power plant back here. This is also some of it here. So it was right at the end of the old Pastor Street Bridge. Actually, you can stay there for a few minutes, Don. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back a few years, or ahead a few years now, to 1951. In 1951, the BC Power Commission installed a 3,750 kilowatt substation on the original powerhouse property. Now, this is kind of interesting. It was a unit sub, and there was, at that time, there was six of them in town. There was one right there. There was one at the top of Brecon Hill. There was one at the top of Wall Street. There was one out by the Fairview School. There was one on Victoria Road at Five Points. There was one on Esplanade. And there was another one. I can't remember where it was. As I told you, my memory would disappear. Third Street? Third Street? Pine Street? No, Pine Street was a big substation. Who? Where's it? I'll think of it. So anyhow, uh, Billy Lewis was here at the, this. Now you'll say, who was Billy Lewis? Well, Billy Lewis, there is Billy. Billy Lewis arrived in Nanaimo at the age of 12 from California. And he apprenticed for five years in the local coal company's machine shops. In 1886, he joined the Nanaimo Electric Light Power and Heating Company and became manager in 1910. Mr. Lewis retired in 1931 after 40 years of service. Billy lived might interest some of you, at 61st Street. You say, well, where's 1st Street? That's out in Harewood. No, it's not. Billy lived on what is now Bryden Street. I'm going to tell you a story about Billy. It always amused me. Billy had his 80th birthday. Frank Ney was invited to his party and they had a party at the house. And Billy said to Frank, you know, Frank, of course, everybody knows Frank Ney was our mayor and real estate man. I'd like you to buy my house. I'll sell it to you for a reasonable price, a very reasonable price, as long as I can live there, as long as I'm alive. Many years later, Frank Ney at a rotary meeting, said it was the worst real estate deal he ever made, because Billy lived to 104. <laughs> 24 years, rent free, and plus Frank had to do repairs, as we all know. I tell you, I'm wandering a bit. It's not all kilowatts. Powerhouse after the fire, the powerhouse was moved right away. After the fire, the company decided to rebuild immediately, but not on the same site. They leased property from the Vancouver Coal Company. Today, that site is on Terminal Avenue at Benson Street, across from Turley's Forest. It is called the City Center Plaza. Now, I'm going to look at this picture here. And it's, of course, this is all tin up here, and I'm thinking back, and I might be wrong, but there was a good furniture store that was, there was the tin building, right? 
And, uh, and then I think later it became uh, Gibbs Stevens Auction House. So it's a possibility, because this place never burned down, that uh, that was part of that building. Now, Len Lawrence, he worked here. I don't know if that's Len or not. This is still steam power, fed by coal, and Len was interviewed on December the 7th, 1953. And here's what Len had to say. I arrived in Nanaimo in 1874. I started to work for the power company August 22nd, 1904, as a fireman for $60 a month from dusk to dawn, when peak loads were going on as on Saturday nights, we burned Lady Smith special washed nut coal, four tons per shift at a cost of four dollars a ton, plus four cords of wood at about $2.75. 275, that's pretty good. I think it's a buck sixty or a dollar sixty or hundred and sixty a cord right now. All other items used slack coal from Nanaimo was used at two dollars a ton. So that's the building there. And that got moved a little later, which we'll talk about. Very interesting piece of machinery. And the powerhouse we're going to go to now, oh, we're going big time, water power, water power. In 1904, the company Nanaimo Electric built a new power plant on the Millstone River to be run by hydropower. This land is actually, now I think the address is 200 or 210 Caledonia Avenue. Now, these stacks, I was talking to some other people, they of course passed away now, those stacks were, were 90 feet high, and they were man manufactured and made in here in Nanaimo by the Nanaimo Foundry. The land was cleared out too, that's flat there, you can see it's quite steep. They spent a lot of time clearing the land to make it flat there. Now, we can swing over to the dam, or I can just keep talking here, Don, whatever you want, or... The dam, well, this is some more, these are... Here again is that smokestack, and these were boilers and headers to create the steam to run the power plant when the millstone went pretty near dry in the summertime. In fact, as you all know, being in Imoites, there's hardly any water in there at all. But if you go over there right now, boy, we could sure generate a lot of power. These pictures are all collections we have. Here are the linemen are working here. And I believe this is uh, Norm Parker and Ben Griffiths up the top. And they're just adding some onto it. I don't know who this fella is here. The truck there, of course, down below is a, a Nanaimo Duncan Utilities truck, I believe. Okay, now we're going to talk about the dam. So I went down the archives. Where, where, where's my gals? Found the picture for me. There they are. And uh, it was difficult. The dam, one article I read said this is where the Quarterway Hotel is, Don. The Quarterway Hotel, and I'm reading one article and kind of looking up on it. And it sits a quarter of a mile upstream from the Quarterway Hotel. Twenty minutes later, I'm reading another article that says quarter of a mile downstream. Well, it's getting a little confusing. So we found this map, and this, going back to the Quarterway Hotel, and downstream, 
This is where the dam is. And this is the area they took. Nanaimo Electric Light Power and Heating Company. And the water backed up there as a reservoir for when the water got lower in the summertime. But it still got so low that the dam wasn't that much of a success. Here we are nowadays. Here is the Quarterway Hotel over there. Bowen Road. In those days it was called Comox Road up to that area. And the soccer field or ball field, whatever you want. So it was flooded in this area over here. This Jingleplot Road is up here. Yeah. Or town site, so town site. site, and there's Bourbon Avenue comes down along the river. So you can give you an idea where most of the dam was in relation to Bourbon Avenue. The Melstone. Uh, can we go to the uh, the dam? Oh, you, mean, you want to see? Well, it doesn't matter. Anyhow, you put it on there when you want. <laughs> the Millstone was dammed about a quarter of a mile downstream from the present Quarterway Hotel, near the soccer field. It was made out of wood. It was 150 feet long, 14 feet high, and 12 feet wide. It was filled with tons of rock with cement on the face side. Water was conveyed from here through a ditch 720 feet long, then into an open flume 2,000 feet long to a large tank, 12 by 25 by 14 foot tank. From this tank, a 30 inch pipe went 1,800 feet, then 26 inch pipe that brought another 400 feet to the powerhouse. The water struck three pelting wheels in the old powerhouse Pelting wheels are sort of like old water wheels, if you must know. Go round, round, and create the power to produce the power. Now, the uh, dam itself is going. Well, can we get a Here's movement? Now, this is really this is wonderful, and I got this from um, Lois. Miller, Miller, and she was uh, Frank Cartwright's daughter. You know who I'm talking about, some of you out there, good. And she asked one time when she was about six years old, where does the power come from, Dad? And he took her up here and they took an old eight millimeter film of it. And we have that. So can we get the water moving there again? It's hard to. Yeah, there it is. There it is. We haven't seen any still pictures of it even. So we think this is this is coming over the top. Now, an interesting story here. I was talking to Leroy Brown, the baddest man in the whole damn town. Only this Leroy Brown's from the Nine he's not from Chicago. And Leroy, I was just talking to him about three weeks ago. Leroy Brown said, Oh, the dam, I remember that when we were young fellows. We had a swimming hole just down below it. And of course, it would get pretty dry, so we would sneak up to the dam and pull a few boards out, and the water would run down in, and we'd fill our swimming hole up. Away we went. I thought that was a great story. <coughs> old Leroy Brown built the swimming hole from lifting, apparently sliding some boards up to fill his swimming hole with the boys. Now the old steam plant, it got moved to 
the one that we looked at on Terminal Avenue, where goods were, it got moved up. Curious, if, and there's, there's Lois right there, up at the dam when it was built. 1907, the company purchased land from Dave Westwood and Western Field Company, 200 acres in all, to store water. They built a dam with earth and a clay core wall. It is 150 feet long, 40 feet high, and a 75 foot base. This is now Westwood Lake. From 1907 to 1921, water was released into the millstone from the lake when the river was low in the summer. Excuse me. Now Frank Cartwright, who was the father of these little girls here, was the chief engineer with Nanaimo Duncan Utilities and the plant on the millstone. He lived at 285 McClary Street. Some of you know where he lived, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, they know where he lived. And he started with the Nanaimo Duncan Utilities in 1926 and retired from the BC Power Commission in 1948. You will note now it is NDU. In 1926, the company bought out Duncan Utilities and spent $250,000 replacing the flume, which we talked about before, with a 36 inch wood stave pipe and installed two more boilers. I'm waiting, Don. <laughs> Well, that's Billy Frank. And there's Frank there at the station down on the millstone. Okay, this is a pipe, and it's also in, in Billy Lewis's diaries when they went underneath the railway tracks. These are the railway tracks up here. And they went underneath the railway tracks. Hand up. There's the wood stave pipe right there. Yeah, there it is. to be lowered into the trench. And then the other one. This is Bradley Street, believe it or not. Here's that wood stave going right up Bradley Street. Hard to believe. How big a pipe? 36 inches. It's the one they changed out. Okay, I'm going, this is here. In 1990, I interviewed, well, I'll tell you what, Leave it there. In 1990, I interviewed Al Jackson. Do people, anybody out here remember Al Jackson? Well, I interviewed him, and uh, I was doing the Gas Lights to Gigawatts, and I interviewed a lot of people. And these were his words. My dad built a hydro. The dam was up on Bowen Road, and the 36-inch wood stave pipeline took the water down underneath the railway tracks, to the power plant. For steam, it was fed by coal that came from Nanaimo. The coal wasn't pulverized and shoveled in by the crew. They used great big scoop shovels. I remember that shoveling was a hot, dirty job, not something everybody would want to do. These scoop shovels <coughs> were like big snow shovels, five or six or maybe even ten times as big as a regular dirt scoop you get. They would throw the coal up into the bunker about eight feet into the air. And he says, it seemed like that anyway, but then I might have been only five foot two inches at the time. <laughs> now the trucks, this is, you'll notice, Duncan Utilities Limit. 
And the names are there, Sid, Dick, and Joe Piper. And I, I was down searching for pictures in Duncan, and this one was in the Duncan Museum. We'll show you another picture after, but I'll tell you the story. And uh, the other picture is Sid, Pitt, and Burt Bennett that becomes Nanaimo Duncan Utilities Limited. And I said, boy, I'd sure like to have those pictures for my collection. And they said, well, that's fine, Mr. Morris. Uh, it'll cost you $20 a piece. And there was dead silence from me. <laughs> And I said, oh, well, I know who those guys are. <laughs> and they said, do you know who they are? I said, yeah. They said, who are they? And I said, it'll cost you $20 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Made a deal. <laughs> Made a deal. And these were good. Actually, I worked, Sid Pitt ended up being a line supervisor here in Nanaimo. And Burt Bennett ended up being a foreman in Duncan. Back to Westwood Lake, you can leave them done. 1921, the company built a little brick powerhouse at the bottom of Westwood Lake Road next to the millstone and used water from Westwood Lake to run the generators. This way the water was recycled by emptying back into the millstone. In other words, it went through the powerhouse and back into the millstone. And do we have Mr. Easterbrook? John Easterbrook, I'm sure people remember John. My friend John, in 24 truck, BC Power Commission. And I interviewed John in 1990. John tried off and on get work in 1935. He started then, but here's his words. Here's what John had to say. I used to take my bucket down to the old Nanaimo Duncan warehouse on Fraser Street. This is the one we talked about that didn't burn down. Old Ben Griffiths, or somebody would come out and say, there's no work today, and I would take my bucket back home again. I didn't get on permanent until Bill McGregor went reading meters and I got his truck. Now, Bill McGregor was also a truck driver and he was also an alderman many years for the city of Nanaimo, as was Jack Little, one, another one of our employees, and another one was Arnie Dugan. It was said it was easier to get hired on if you drank beer with Ben Griffiths, but I didn't have enough money. The line room was on Fraser Street when I first started, and the powerhouse was on Caledonia. When they built the Westwood Lake Dam, the water came down the pipeline right to the generating station, a little building at the bottom of Westwood Lake Road that turned the turbines. Dick Alexander was the engineer. It was a wood pipeline. I helped build it. Once they covered it up with a small cat or something and broke a hole in the pipe, the only way they could fix it was with red lead and I had to go down that pipe to do it. I crawled down about 500 yards, maybe more than that, and I had to spread the red lead down there, which wasn't the safest thing in the world. I asked John, I said, well, could you turn around? He said, no, I have to back out. <laughs> Can you imagine going down that far, 500 yards, more than that? And of course, red light is like asbestos today, or it wasn't the safest thing in the world. Okay, the company continued to expand. 1935, this is Bill McGregor, and this is the truck that John took over. And Bill went reading meters, it was a softer job, and he ended up actually running uh, all the meters in Nanaimo. 1935, they built a line can leave that there, it's okay, to Craig Crossing. 1936, the Northfield Mine was energized. 1937, my hometown, 
cable to Salt Spring Island. We're going to get power in 1937. And I can remember this quite vividly. My grandmother getting power in her house. It was an old drop cord. And I was in the house and she turned on the light and said, isn't that marvelous? And shut it off. <laughs> and then there's the story of the lady in the 50s up in Denman Island. My ex-brother-in-law was up there. Electricians were wiring up there. And the lady was there and Tom was there. And the electrician said to the lady, would you like a light on your back porch? And she said, oh, yes, that would be wonderful. It would be much easier for me to see to fill my kerosene lamps. <laughs> <laughs> That's all spring out. Cable in those days. Okay, Pine Street. Pine Street sub, that was when it was built. And if you realize now, you drive right over top of it. It was the main feed for all of Nanaimo, being a very important substation. But right now, if you come up Fitzwilliam and head out the highway there, that's, you go right over top of that. Okay, this is kind of interesting. This is the start of the new NDU office. There's Nash's hardware. And the fella in the front here is uh, Skip Cyril, Cyril Cawthorn, but he preferred to be called Skip. And his son, George Cawthorn, drove truck for the BC Power Commission and the BC Hydro for many years. So it's the start of the building. If you note that building away in the back, that one is, says Medill's on it, which is quite interesting. And Nash's Hardware. So they're building the new building. Now, I see Muriel McKay is here today. And I phoned her up about a week ago and said, Muriel, do you still have that postcard of the Nanaimo Duncan Utilities building? She said, yes, yes, Michael, I've got it. Would you like to have it? I said, oh, you bet. I'd really <laughs> like to have it. So there's the building completed with Nanaimo Duncan Utilities up the top. There's a Nash's Hardware, of course, next door. and. Here was, I believe it was a Chinese festival shop, wasn't it? Sam Lee. Sam, Sam Lee? Sam Lee. Okay. There, there's an Austin A40 in front. I think that's a Chevy there. There's a, looks like a refrigerator in the window. And notice the street light right on the corner there. Underground, back in those days. Now, Muriel also gave me this, which I just love, because I've had more fun saying to people, where is it? Ten people, maybe one or two, got it right. The building there, of course, is the white one. Where's your little arrow down? That's the Nanaimo Duncan Utilities building. In the background is the Bastion Street Bridge. And you notice there's water underneath. And of course, right now on the corner here, I believe that's a fish and chip shop now. And of course, the old bank bill still existing. Going up around the corner, there's the Malcipina Hotel. So, Merida, I really appreciated this one. This is great. Well, I certainly appreciated you coming. 
<laughs> because this fellow remembered that I have had this picture, and it must be over 30 years ago. More than that, because when you were down at Moby Dick. Down at the Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> they told me after 22 years I didn't have much authority anymore. <laughs> but I mentioned it. And she called, she didn't call it a street light. She called it an arc light. <laughs> That's going back. Now, here's an interesting thing. Phone numbers there were quite simple. In an Imo Duncan office, we have, what, 10 digits now? Nymo office was 68, sales department was 67, power house was 310, and that was also night trouble calls, and the mountain plant was phone number 11. 1945, the newly formed BC Power Commission purchased Nanaimo Duncan Utilities as its first acquisition. 1947, BC Power purchased the Qualicum, Parksville, Alberni, and Port Alberni. John Hart. And of course, this is where our power comes from today and even then. John Hart Generating Station. Which, even in those days, Roger K. Brown fought desperately against that, worrying about the fishing, but the Thank goodness didn't destroy any of their fishing. Jingle Pop. And there's Jingle Pop, British Columbia Powerhouse. The Jingle Pop substation, 2208 Jingle Pop Road, became the main control center for the BC Power Commission. It was manned 24 hours a day. And that is the substation being built at Jingle Park. This is Joe Mullins at the Jingle Park substation when it was mad 24 hours a day. Uh, the other fellow, I can't think of his name right now. Bill Shock. Bill Shock, yeah. He told me one time I talked to Bill, he said one time when we had a deep, deep snow, I think it was 1948, he was there for three days before they could get to him, and he ran out of sandwiches. He was getting pretty hungry, <laughs> but he had to stay on the job. And downtown. This ledger, this is when they moved into it. This ledger, which we can't locate, is Nanaimo Duncan Utilities ledger, how they kept record of everything the way back when. Here they are in the new office with all this modern machinery. Look at the typewriters. Boy, they're really about 1943. Really proud of themselves. And here they are again upstairs in the same building. This just we threw this in just for fun of it. It's just the boys setting poles. Notice no hard hats in the old A-frame truck. Hard hats didn't become mandatory till about 1954. So then, here's the downtown office. Actually, when I was there, uh, the little, this is centennial year. I'm trying to remember that logo there. Oh, it doesn't matter. And of course, the Wicked's High Warehouse, where I worked out of. And sadly, well, I say sadly, it's gone now. They sold the property, as you can see, and it's all the university area now, and actually shops they built. Now, Don went up to the millstone, and we just thought we'd throw these in. This is where the dam was. This is where it was. 
right there. There's a couple of yep. concrete pillars <coughs> like they were supporting a, a pipe or something. There's one there and there's one here. If you've got a close up there. There's a round saddle to it, like a pipe is in there, but yeah. there's no real <coughs> remnants of the dam there. Don't you? It's just a close up of that pillar. That's the end. Okay, and just to end the story, you might find lucky to find some foundations of the original tower house on Fraser Street, uh, the millstone plant on Caledonia Avenue. I was down there, there's absolutely nothing there. Nothing, you just can't find anything. Uh, and of course, the old brick powerhouse and the operator's house at the bottom of Westwood Lake are still there. And they are owned privately. I went to one of our big managers after I had retired and said, how about buying that property for posterity, keep it, redo the powerhouse. And of course they just about fell off the chairs, told me I was crazy, so that was the end of that project. The dam at Westwood Lake still exists, and in 1957, about 200 acres of the commission's property changed hands for one dollar. The deed was presented to Mayor Pete Maffeo. The condition of the sale was that the lake should be used for recreational purposes only, which exists today. Thank you for your time.